so I'm a little off. So don't hold it against me. <clears throat> How are you, sir? I'm not going to shake your hand. <clears throat> are we ready? Are we waiting for anyone else? I know. Mean any more? Anyone else from room nine? Okay, good. So, good afternoon. Good to see you all. Um, the council is going to vote today to landmark. Uh, some properties in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, which are the Interborough Rapid Transit IRT Company Powerhouse. Many of you may know it. If you drive up the West Side Highway, it's that building with the big stacks. It's a gorgeous, beautiful building. I can't believe it has been landmarked already. Uh, that building is in Councilmember Helen Rosenthal's district. Another building is the Empire State Dairy Company Buildings, located in Councilmember Rafael Espinal's district. And 827 and 831 Broadway buildings, which is located in Councilmember Carlino Rivera's district. Um, and I'm sure these members will talk about this at the stated meeting. Uh, next, the council is going to vote on a package of legislation to better serve the needs of runaway and homeless youth. This piece of legislation is very near and dear to me. Before I was elected to the city council in 2013, I was on the board of the Ali Forney Center. Uh, which is kind of the largest provider for LGBT runaway homeless youth. Um, and um, heartbreaking, heartbreaking stories. Too many times young people who are part of the LGBTQ community end up being kicked out of their homes and on the streets because of their sexual orientation. There's still a large amount of parental rejection here, even in New York City. And as a city, we must do everything we can to protect them, as well as all young people. With that in mind, I sponsored introduction uh, 410A, which would require the Department of Youth and Community Development to develop a plan to provide shelter to all runaway and homeless youth who request shelter. This bill would require DYCD to report annually on runaway and homeless youth. There is another introduction, introduction 490A, sponsored by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, which would require that runaway and homeless youth be permitted to remain in runaway and homeless youth shelters for extended periods of time, doubling the permitted time in a crisis shelter from 30 days to 60 days. Currently, the law says if you're in a, a, one of these shelters, the maximum amount of time you can spend is 30 days. This bill would double that time to 60 days, which is much better for these young people who are very vulnerable. And it would extend the time in, tra in a transitional living facility from 18 months to 24 months. The last part of this package is introduction 556A, which is sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres. It would require the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, to include shelter services for homeless young adults, uh, youth ages 21 to 24, as part of its continuum to runaway homeless youth services. This is really, really, really important. The reason why this is important is because the state last year and the city had asked for it for a very long time to up the age from 21 to 24 of young people who could stay in the RHY system. In the past, when you turned 21, you would have to leave the RHY system and go to the DHS system, which many 21-year-olds did not feel safe in, so they wouldn't end up in the DHS cell system. They'd end up on the streets or on the subways. Uh, participating in survival sex and doing all sorts of other things because they couldn't stay in a shelter that was working for them. So Councilmember Torres' bill uh, expands it and aligns city law with what the state law grants us by letting young people up to 24 years old be able to participate in uh, the RHY shelter system. I would invite the two council members to come, but everyone's a little delayed uh, because of the snow, but you'll hear them up. And the last, my good, good, good friend, uh, Councilmember Mark Traeger is here. We're going to vote on Resolution 177. It's sponsored by Councilmember Traeger, which calls on the New York State Legislature to amend Penal Law Section 130.05, which is related to the lack of consent uh, for sexual acts, to add persons in police custody to the list of persons deemed incapable of consenting to a sexual act when it comes to a police officer. This is an important resolution, and I am super happy that Councilmember Traeger has actually been the leader on this. The fact that this hasn't been on the books already is deeply disturbing and something that must be fixed immediately. Before I turn it over to um, Councilmember Traeger to give some remarks on this, uh, he may not say it, so I'll say it. 
the incident that happened in South Brooklyn with a young woman who was in police custody where uh, she was allegedly raped uh, by two officers. The first person to come out on this issue before anyone in the state legislature talked about it, before the governor talked about it, the very first person was Councilor Traeger. Go back, look at the press clips. The, the state legislature and the governor then came on board uh, and decided to do something and put it in the 30-day amendments to include it in the state budget. But the person who had been talking about it since the day it happened in South Brooklyn, in his district, in Gravesend, was Councilmember Traeger. And so I am glad that we are passing this resolution. Um, usually the council does not get much press around resolutions uh, because Albany, sadly, doesn't always pay much attention to our resolutions. Uh, but. Um, given the fact that Councilmember Traeger has been a leader on this, uh, I think it's important that we're passing this today and it shows that this council and uh, Councilmember Traeger were the leaders on this from the very beginning. So I turn it over to him to talk about this resolution. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And for the record, one of the first leaders to reach out to quickly offer support was Speaker Corey Johnson. So I thank you so much for your leadership and your support. As many of you are aware, a teenage girl was raped by two Brooklyn South narcotics detectives in my district last September. The detectives tried to mount a defense by claiming it was consensual. They have since resigned, but we need strong laws in place to make sure that this never happens again. Our laws regarding sexual consent must be brought in line with basic common sense, empathy, and human decency. There can be no consent if someone is in the custody of a law enforcement officer. State law wisely recognizing, recognizes that inmates can't give consent to corrections officers. Parolees can't give consent to parole officers. All law enforcement must be held to this same standard. I'm proud to have worked with the Assembly to fix this serious loophole in the Penal Code. The Assembly passed a bill last month based on our City Council resolution. I've also introduced a bill that would prohibit sexual contact between police and peace officers and individuals in their custody, but the resolution gets to the root of the problem by fixing the loophole in the state penal code, and it ensures that all New Yorkers would be protected. To be clear, the power dynamics between a trusted agent of a criminal justice system and an individual under supervision mean that no sexual consent can be given entirely free from coercion. And I thank the speaker and my colleagues for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Traeger. And um, then lastly, we are uh, voting today on some very important uh, land use measures. Uh, my good friend, uh, Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson is here. She has spent uh, not just the last week negotiating uh, in a very serious, robust, continuous way on the Jerome Corridor rezoning in her district and in Councilmember Cabrera's district. But she has spent the last year uh, working on this issue with dozens of community meetings, uh, working with the Department of City Planning, the borough president, her colleagues in the state legislature that represent the district, her residents and tenants throughout her district. And I believe that this rezoning is a very, very big win for her and for the Bronx. It's the first time we've seen a neighborhood rezoning of this scale in the Bronx in decades, since the 1960s. And so I'm really proud of the work that she's accomplished. The subcommittee on zoning and the land use committee voted this out yesterday. So I assume and I hope that the council passes this today. So I want to turn it over and congratulate uh, my friend, uh, Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon to each and every one of you. Um, it's an, always an honor and a pr privilege to be here. And it's been three years. Uh, in 2014, the New York City Department of City Planning put forth the Jerome Neighborhood Rezoning Plan, um, keeping in line with the overall expected population growth in the city of New York to reach 9 million New Yorkers, looking at neighborhoods that could increase in density. And Jerome was identified, the Jerome Cromwell Inwood Corridor, 
Aurora. Uh, we increased the capacity to 95 blocks from 167th and McClellan Street to Jerome Avenue and 184th Street is the area. And we looked at a massive rezoning of areas of R7 increasing to R9, of C1 and M1 areas of looking at mixed use, both of commercial and housing. And I am so proud to say that after three plus years of working on this plan, we have come to an agreement. Uh, $189 million and counting is going to be invested in this neighborhood. We are achieving two brand new schools, one in school district nine, the other in school district 10. We have $1.5 million for the local businesses uh, that we do expect could potentially relocate and be displaced. We are achieving housing preservation of an additional 2,500 units on top of the 5,500 units we've already preserved. Uh, we are looking at economic development and local hiring and jobs and really trying to make sure that we invest in this neighborhood. I am very proud that $50 million of commitment of transportation money, as well as $60 million of park money, including Grant Park, Corporal Fisher Park, Morton Playground, Aqueduct Walk, as well as 1805 Davidson Avenue. Um, I memorized all of this because I've been working on this for three years, and this is really about the heart and soul of the district I've represented for the past four years. And at the end of my tenure, I want people to see that we elected officials cared enough that we made these very hard decisions to not only invest in their future, but their children's future. And so I am grateful for the speaker, for our land use chair, the land use division who worked tirelessly along with me and Councilmember Cabrera and to my staff and everyone who really came together. It was not easy. All of these rezonings tend to be controversial. We've seen neighborhoods change across the city of New York, but after 50 years in the Bronx of not seeing any rezoning. I think it's time. I think it's necessary. I think it's needed. And I am so proud that we have come to this place. And I'm thankful for all of my colleagues' support. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. She clearly knows her district and has worked very hard on this. And I'm really, really proud of her. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, from any of you. Great. Have a good day. <laughs> yes, Connor. I mean, I have serious concerns about what Dermache said at that hearing. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I believe that um, these are all based off of 311 and 911 uh, complaints. Uh, it is not right to have two sets of rules uh, on arrests for marijuana, and unfortunately that's what we've seen and continue to see. I support the legalization of marijuana, not just the decriminalization. Uh, of course, I don't smoke marijuana uh, because I'm sober, and I've been sober for July will be nine years. Uh, but the reason why I support it is because one of the major reasons why I support it is I think it disproportionately, unfairly impacts communities of color, where you have predominantly young black and brown men who are arrested, who get uh, criminal records which haunt them the rest of their lives. Uh, you create an underground market uh, of this. You could create jobs by legalizing marijuana. You could create revenue by legalizing marijuana. And I think there are many reasons to legalize it. In the meantime, the council is going to look at uh, some strategies uh, from a legislative perspective on what we could do to ensure that we do not have two sets of rules and to go further uh, in ensuring that uh, people who are arrested of marijuana possession uh, are not um, unfairly impacted moving forward. One of the other difficulties we have here in the city is that we have five district attorneys who have five different sets of rules on how they uh, deal with marijuana arrests. Um, district Attorney Vance, I think, ha probably has the most forward-thinking approach on this. I support his approach, uh, but I think we could go even farther. Aaron? Or, or 
uh, of course, I voted for uh, the bill when it came up, uh, but I think it's important to work with our state colleagues. I have a very good working relationship with uh, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, and I think it's important to include him in this process in a meaningful way. So we don't have any set plans yet. Uh, the conference hasn't had an opportunity to meet and discuss this. I think that's an important first step. We will do that in the coming weeks uh, to talk as a group about the best path forward. But any path forward is going to require us working with our state legislative partners. I'm not sure. I think there are ups and downs, uh, upsides and downsides to it. Rich? Uh, the mayor recently made uh, comments that um, anyone who um, has an issue with uh, his wife's role in appointments could be a sex abuse. Does that help you agree with? I think Shirlane is a very good person. I think she's done an enormous amount for the city of New York. Um, and I actually really respect the relationship that they have with each other. They're a team. I don't think it's sexist for people to ask questions of this nature. Um, I don't think Errol Lewis was being sexist when he asked these questions. But at the same time, uh, I understand what the mayor is saying, which is that He's been very upfront for years about his partnership and relationship uh, politically with his wife. And um, I think that's totally fair. I have no issue with it. And I really admire the work she's done on Thrive NYC and on the Mayor's Fund um, and taking leadership roles. Um, I have a good working relationship with her. What kind of role has she had with the City Council? She's worked with us on Thrive NYC. She's testified. Uh, at the mental health committee hearing on her plan. Um, I, of course, uh, have gotten to work with her on health-related stuff when I chaired the health committee uh, of the council before I was speaker. And um, when I met with the mayor uh, during the speaker's race, at the end of it, she, was, she participated uh, in those meetings that I had with the mayor. And she was great. She was great. I was glad she was in the room. It was good to have another person there. Jeff? Uh, Tim, the leaders uh, soon met to last week and then yesterday they asked the state to declare a uh, state of emergency in public housing. Um, do you agree with that, that there that there needs to be a state of emergency declared? And what's the latest in terms of what the city council is trying to do to help resolve some of these long-standing issues in public housing? Well, first, I think that tenants do deserve a um, a rebate on their rent, a deduction on their rent based off of the outages that happened in January with the thunder snow coming down right now. I really hope that uh, NYCHA is prepared for uh, other outages that could happen across the city, and I'm concerned about that given what our hearing showed the beginning of February, which was 323,000 New Yorkers were without heat and hot water at the beginning of the heating season from October 1st up until the beginning of February. Clearly, NYCHA has uh, systemic problems that uh, need to be fixed. I want us to speed up the timeline for procurement. I want us to ensure that it doesn't take four winters to get people heat and hot water. Um, would I be open to an emergency declaration if I thought that it was going to substantially uh, cut down on the procurement time it would take to get heat and hot water up and going at a faster pace? Yes, I am still seeking information uh, from NYCHA um, and from the state on if uh, an emergency declaration that focused just on that part, if it would have that impact. I haven't gotten clear answers yet. I'm still asking. Uh, I hope to have answers on that soon. Uh, but clearly, NYCHA has a real problem when it comes to their capital budget needs. And, you know, we've seen a series of people leave NYCHA and top leadership positions over the last four months because of management issues as well. So it's a combination of management and money, both things that the council will continue to play an uh, oversight role in. Jeff? Excuse my late arrival. It's okay. We already answered this, but uh, we've seen a lot of action in Albany and actually some disagreements among Democrats about what to do about gun control. Uh, schools, you know, having a cop with guns after, outside of every school. I wonder if we can expect any movement from the city council, any new bills, any action, or are you kind of leaving this up to Albany to sort it out? 
No, I think it's important for the city, of course, given that the city has to look after our school system and the fact that we have mayoral control, that the mayor and the city council play a meaningful role on whatever school safety measures uh, are going to be implemented in the wake of Parkland. Um, council members Matteo and Borelli, I believe, talked about with, with Borough President Otto uh, last week or the week before some measures that they thought were important. Uh, I know that Councilmember Deutsch and some other members have concerns as well. So we're going to look at all of those. Um, I haven't had the chance. I was away last week on vacation. I haven't had a chance to talk with the mayor about this. The mayor and I are going to get together probably next week, sit down, have a conversation about a variety of issues, and I'm sure this issue will come up. But I, I don't think it's important just to leave it to the state. I saw a Politico story. Um, from the Albany Bureau related to the Assembly and the Senate not being able to agree on what the correct measures were. I agree with Speaker Hastie's comments um, as he put forward related to how we handle school safety. Some more? Speaker, um, since the mayor announced that he's going to convene a charter revision commission, have you had any conversations with him about perhaps our consultations on appointees? And do you still think that getting fi campaign finance and I support a Charter Revision Commission. I think a Charter Revision Commission should be called. Uh, I do not support a Charter Revision Commission to put forward meetings and proposals uh, that is pre-baked or that in any way would handle items that should be legislated by the council. A Charter Revision Commission should look at things that are structural in the governance of New York City. Some ideas that I have that are not just my ideas, but I've looked at what past people have considered, independent budgeting for the public advocate, for the borough presidents, for the controller, for community boards, advising consent on additional mayoral appointees and nominations, uh, looking at the land use process, looking at units of appropriation as part of the budget process. Those are things that we at the council cannot legislate. They're in the city charter, they go to the structure of city government, and we can't legislate them. The issues that the mayor put forward, while they may be worthy issues, they are not issues that the public needs to vote on as part of a Charter Revision Commission. The council could legislate those items. A year and a half ago, the council passed, uh, Jeff, over a dozen bills related to campaign finance, uh, 22 bills. So 22 bills we passed on the CFB. Uh, we had hearings. Uh, we worked with good government groups, we worked with the CFB, we did those things. We do not need a Charter Revision Commission to do those things. It goes to the heart of our legislative authority as a body. So I do not support a Charter Revision Commission that is going to go to items that we should be legislating and debating here at the Council. If the Mayor has bills that he thinks or issues with the CFB that he thinks should be handled from a legislative perspective, he can do bills at the request of the mayor. He could assign those bills to an individual council member, and we could have a hearing on those bills. I want to look at the structure of city government. Quick follow-up, have you had those conversations with the mayor? The mayor knows how I feel. <laughs> but have you talked about appointees by any chance? We have not talked about appointees. I feel sick over it. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a street in New York City that's long been uh, considered dangerous. There have been fatalities and near misses there before. Um, the city uh, has said that it will explore changes there. I think closer to your district, um, there's a lot of pushback on some of the L train mitigation stuff and the 13th Street bikeway and how that will all get hashed out. Mm -hmm. I think Vision Zero has been a huge success, and we saw much fewer uh, record low number of pedestrian fatalities and cyclist fatalities because of the street calming measures and making our streets safer. When you have a tragedy, I don't want to get too emotional, but when you have a tragedy like this with uh, two babies being killed, it makes it all feel sort of for naught. You know, it makes, you, makes it feel like everything you've done 
the countless lives you may have saved that you don't know about, it makes it all feel sort of like meaningless when you have two babies that are killed. So I think the community boards play an important role. I chaired a community board before I was elected to the council. I, I really appreciate the work that they do. Um, every community board is different. Every neighborhood is different. I have been a proud, staunch supporter of safe streets. I've been a proud supporter of traffic calming measures throughout my district. I've worked with the community boards and block associations and the Department of Transportation anywhere I can. I've actually pushed the Department of Transportation. If you look at past uh, transportation budget hearings before I was speaker, I was always pushing them on additional traffic calming measures in my own district. Um, so. Could the process be different? Yes, uh, I guess. I don't know how, um, but it's just so horrible what happened. And um, my heart is with the families and the community, and we need to fix that intersection right away. And this woman should be arrested. I don't know why she was let go from the police precinct. If you looked at her traffic history, running red lights, speeding in your schools. I think there were over a dozen moving violations that she had. I do not know why she was let go. I agree. It's completely, um, it doesn't make any sense. And it is, as, as a former assemblywoman, now councilwoman, is saying, it's state law. Uh, and we don't get to decide what the penalties are for moving violations. Um, so I would, of course, strengthen this. And that woman should not have been driving that car. Aaron? Uh, we're not in political season yet, and I uh, have a good working relationship with the governor. He and I speak quite regularly. Uh, I think Cynthia is a good person. She's a friend. Uh, she's done a lot for New York City, uh, and I admire her. At the same time, uh, Governor Cuomo, I think, has been a progressive leader on a variety of issues, whether it be marriage equality or increasing the minimum wage uh, or paid family leave, um, strengthening unions. On all of those issues, I think he's shown an enormous amount of leadership. So we're not in political season yet. Um, I have not had a single conversation with the governor about his reelection. I haven't had a conversation with Cynthia uh, about if her exploration of running for governor. Um, I know Terry Gibson quite well. I supported him when he ran for state senate. He hasn't called me. Uh, so I haven't had these conversations yet. And uh, I'm sure we'll have those conversations uh, when petitioning starts uh, later this spring. Samar? I think when petitioning starts, we can have more of the, because uh, I'll be out on the streets, so then you can actually ask me, you know, <laughs> why are you collecting petitions for that person? So, anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks.